Our next topic to turn our attention to is the conservation of biodiversity. And biodiversity means the diversity of living things. And this is for section A4.2. So biodiversity means the diversity of living things that are on the planet. Uh, we can look at this at a couple of different levels. Starting most broad, this would be within ecosystems. And an ecosystem is a combination of all of the living things in an area, as well as the abiotic, the non-living components. Uh, so like um, water temperature, sunlight, uh, pH, et cetera. Uh, and so this is uh, looking at it at an ecosystem level is uh, all of the combinations of species within uh, living together in the same community. And at a community level, we're talking about all of the different populations uh, within the same geographic area. We can also look at the just general number of species uh, in terms of biodiversity. And this would be the number of groups of reproducing organisms that we see. Uh, and then also lastly, at a genetic level, and this would be the variety of genes within the uh, gene pools of particular species. So we've got ecosystems, we've got species, and we've got uh, uh, biodiversity at a genetic level. So how many different species do we have living on the planet? Uh, estimates range anywhere from about two to 10 million uh, eukaryotes that are currently living on the planet. There's too many unknowns to include all of the prokaryotes. We just, honestly, we really just don't completely know. Uh, it's difficult to, to estimate the number of species that have lived in the past because fossil records are challenging and that they are, it's difficult to indicate exact uh, specific numbers. Um, so we really only have relative numbers and it's a prediction of how much life existed on the past, uh, on the planets in the past. And so over the course of Earth's history, we've seen some major extinctions that have really changed the biodiversity of life. And a, an extinction is when there's a termination of a taxon uh, by the death of its last member. There's no more of that particular tax on that species. And so then over Earth's history, we've seen major, uh, five major extinctions. The last was about 65, 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous period. And this is when the dinosaurs went extinct due to a large asteroid colliding with Earth. Past extinctions probably were most likely caused by volcanic activity. That's what the evidence suggests. Um, extinctions, when they do occur, they they represent a reset of sorts in which the biodiversity generally increases after that extinction and it changes the presence of the types of species that are on the planet. And so after the crustaceous extinction, there were many new bird and mammal species that, uh, that developed um, uh, after, after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Uh, biodiversity has generally increased since the Cretaceous period, but as we've seen human activity and population growth change and increase over time, uh, that's starting to impact biodiversity, and we're going to talk about that more in this video. And so uh, a, a book uh, that I would really recommend is called um, The Sixth Extinction. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, book about uh, written by Elizabeth Colbert that really looks at this possibility of a sixth extinction that we are maybe undergoing right now in terms of the number of species that we are seeing go extinct. It's normal for species to go extinct. That happens during Earth's history. However, the rate at which we're seeing species go extinct right now is, is much greater and suggests that maybe we're undergoing and experiencing a sixth extinction. And this book really looks at uh, the evidence that supports that idea. Now that we've defined extinction, we want to turn our attention to anthropogenic extinction. And this is an environmental change that's caused or influenced by people, either directly or indirectly. So it's humans that are having some impact. Uh, and so there's lots of different causes of extinction uh, that are specifically anthropogenic. And so we're gonna discuss uh, a wide variety of these, starting with over-harvesting. Uh, and this would be for plants or animals, hunting, timber, fishing, etc. cetera. Uh, it occurs at a faster rate than the species are able to reproduce. Uh, and so hum as humans collect these different resources, if we, if we do it faster than the species are able to reproduce, Thus, we have over-harvesting. The second would be habitat destruction. And over 13 billion hectares, and there's about two and a half acres per hectare, so it's a lot of land, uh, is currently being used for livestock, either actually rearing the livestock itself or cultivating food for the livestock. And this is generally uh, has led to the destruction of natural landscapes to increase the space for the farming, uh, also some for human habitats. The Amazon rainforest is a, unfortunately an example of this as we see more and more of that rainforest being lost to provide uh, additional space for farming. A third example would be invasive species, and these are alien species that are not native to a particular ecosystem being introduced by humans, uh, can really change the native species and cause them or lead them to extinction by predation, spreading of diseases, competition, 
um, it has big impact on the native species. Some examples of this in my particular region in the Pacific Northwest, uh, blackberry bushes are, are invasive and non-native and spread and, and take over areas. Uh, another example would be uh, lionfish that were released probably uh, somewhere in Florida and have now spread throughout the Caribbean and are not native there and are really just decimating other uh, native uh, fish species that live there. Pollution is a fourth example. The burning of fossil fuels, uh, agricultural mining, oil production, or oil extraction and production, uh, pharmaceuticals, all are major sources of pollution that are then released out into the environment and affects the, the region and then also the entire world. Air pollution is one of the greatest uh, health and environmental problems, both indoor and outdoor. And so that not only affects uh, local species, but also humans uh, ourselves. A fourth example would be climate change, uh, global climate change. And as um, the conditions around the world begin to change, and we're seeing changes take place within the climate, uh, species can adapt to those conditions that they experience. But if the, the, if the conditions change too quickly, then the species uh, doesn't have time to be able to adapt. Adaptation takes time. It takes many generations. And so a species can't adapt if those changes are taking place too rapidly. Additionally, we're seeing human activities are really causing rapid changes in temperature and rainfall, snow cover, and other environmental variables, which is just compounding and, and speeding up this process. Uh, outside of this video, uh, it would be recommended that uh, look at a couple of different uh, examples of species changing. One would be extinction of the moas, uh, the Caribbean monk seal, and then a third would be a local species that has gone extinct. We'll do this in my class, but if you're watching from somewhere else, recommend that you do this on your own time. Now we want to look at specifically uh, how ecosystems are being lost. And this is either through direct or indirect causes of ecosystem loss, uh, starting with agricultural land expansion. expansion. We've men uh, mentioned this already, uh, but really since the 1970s, we've seen massive changes in the amount of land that's used for agricultural purposes. And this is uh, particularly to old growth tropical forest ecosystems like those in the Amazon. A uh, second example that goes along with this would be urbanization. Uh, the expansion of urban areas uh, has doubled since the 1990s, early 1990s, uh, to support human population growth. As the population gets bigger, we need more space to be able to spread out. Natural ecosystems have been cleared to be able to support this. Additionally, human costs, over -exploitation, exploitation of natural resources such as wood, uh, hunting, fishing, uh, those would be some primary examples of, of this uh, over-exploitation. Mining and smelting have really uh, led to ecosystem loss through the destruction of natural ecosystems by either the land use change or the pollution as a result uh, of the action it obviously has some very negative impacts. Acid rain, copper, nickel, and other metals can really uh, impact um, uh, water systems and the uh, ecosystems. Uh, building of dams and water extraction. Uh, this leads to the loss of natural ecosystems. The Colorado River, for example, rarely ever flows to the Pacific Ocean. It just runs out, uh, typically by the time that it gets to Mexico. Uh, and the use of groundwater, groundwater being water that's under the ground, it's pumped out uh, uh, from these aquifers. Uh, it's becoming an issue where areas are starting to run out of water. Uh, parts of the Southwest United States, we're actually seeing cities that run out of water and don't have water for periods of time and water has to be brought in to be able to support those cities and those towns. Uh, another example would be the drainage or diversion of water for human use. And this can really change the, um, or eliminate complete ecosystems because of the, the moving of how water flows and, and its water system. Uh, fertilize, uh, fertilizer uh, pollution, and then that runoff of the fertilizer, this can cause a process called eutrophication. Uh, and this leads to algae blooms. Uh, Lake Erie uh, of the Great Lakes has been significantly impacted by algae blooms. And they're, they're frequent also off the Florida coast and Gulf of Mexico. Um, images of Lake Erie, but if you, if you look this up, you can see it, it's pretty typically happening now every year with large algae blooms in Mexico. And this is runoff from excess fertilizer from farming, uh, runs into the rivers, uh, and then eventually gets out into the ocean and creates this large bloom of algae that then creates a toxic environment and essentially kills pretty much everything that's found in that water area. Um, it can also happen locally within small lakes uh, or, or very stagnant, uh, slow moving uh, areas of water. Uh, lastly would be climate change. And this is when the variables of climate change um, 
of impacts and can lead to the loss of ecosystems. Um, and we'll spend some time investigating the local impacts of climate change uh, here as well. An additional topic that you'll want to spend some time taking a look at and researching uh, for ecosystem lo loss is the dipterocarp forest ecosystem that's in Southeast Asia, as well as, again, um, an, e an ecosystem that's been impacted uh, in your local area, depending on where that's at. So now that we've established some of the causes of the biodiversity crisis, we want to turn our attention to the evidence. And in science, uh, a claim such as that there's a biodiversity crisis needs to be supported by evidence. And so there's lots of evidence that supports this. Uh, the I PBES, or Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, assesses, this is an organization that assesses the state of biodiversity worldwide, and it looks at a, a number of different variables uh, to monitor our biodiversity and, and see is it a problem, is there a crisis? And so some things that are examined would be population sizes, the range of species, diversity of species within an ecosystem, the richness and unevenness of uh, biodiversity, ecosystem size, number of species threatened uh, within a taxonic group, and the genetic diversity within a species, going back to what we talked about with uh, biodiversity at the very beginning of this video. Um, all these images and discussions that we've looked at previously are, are evidence and examples of this, and um, many of the images and graphs that were presented are from uh, the website Our World and Data, in which you can, um, um, has been collected and uh, summarized uh, information from all over the world to be able to present uh, and examine this issue of biodiversity, and, and that's a great source of information to support this claim. A 2019 United Nations Biodiversity Report found that approximately one million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, and that's more than ever before in human history. That's a staggering amount of species. One other source that uh, has been really valuable in examining this biodiversity uh, crisis is not just scientists, but citizen scientists. And this is um, just general citizens uh, that have an interest in science or an interest in biodiversity or particular species. And are spending their time going out and collecting data uh, about uh, particular populations or ecosystems on a regular basis for many years and, and have helped contribute to data to be able to uh, track biodiversity and um, uh, numbers uh, of particular species within their local habitats and ecosystems. So the causes of this biodiversity crisis have really already been presented and discussed uh, as we've gone through other sections in the video. Um, in the anthropogenic extinction and ecosystem loss sections, uh, to, to quickly recap, overexploitation of resources, urbanization, deforestation, pollution, invasive species, climate change, human-induced climate change, all of these are directly related to human population growth. And so as human population has grown and expand, we're seeing uh, this biodiversity crisis increase. Uh, 2019, again, that same 2019 United Nations Biodiversity Report suggested that 75% of terrestrial and 66% of marine environments have been severely altered as a result of human activity. And, and that's a massive impact based off of our, uh, our actions. So while much of this video is really uh, doom and gloom and all of the negatives that are happening, there are positives. Uh, there are many different organizations that are working towards trying to reestablish uh, species that are threatened uh, or are near extinction, uh, ecosystems as well, and a couple different pro approaches to biodiversity conservation uh, are what we'll discuss now. And the first is called in situ, uh, and this is a method to conserve species in natural habitats uh, this would be an ideal approach, it can be accomplished by creating protected areas. Uh, so for example, the Maasai Mara in Africa is a protected area that the, the um, local species are able to uh, survive there uh, without the threat of poaching and, and being impacted. Uh, there are marine environment protected areas all throughout the world. Uh, those would be examples of in situ uh, conservation methods. Uh, in terms of benefits, they keep the species in location that they're adapted to. It allows them to interact with other species. Behavior patterns can remain the same or normal. Nature reserves, um, they do require active management uh, well, as well as removal of alien species, uh, sometimes reintroduction of, uh, of native species, man management of population sizes, uh, management of poaching, uh, sometimes supplementary feeding as well. Uh, and, and in addition to this is the process of rewilding 
uh, and this would be a form of ecological restoration aimed at increasing biodiversity and restoring natural processes. It differs from just ecological restoration in that while humans may be involved, uh, its, its main purpose is to reduce human influence on ecosystems as much as possible. So that's all in situ. Ex situ is the preservation of species outside of their natural habitats. Uh, and examples of this would be like growth of plants in botanical gardens or animals in zoos. Uh, and this is um, uh, made possible by the removal of species to a new location uh, to be able to protect them from whatever the, the environmental impact is that's uh, impacting them. Um, for example, birds in New Zealand moved off to offshore locations to protect from invasive species. That'd be an example of this. Um, or long-term storage of germplasm, um, and this is material uh, that would be used to propagate in the future, such as like seed banks or egg and sperm storage. The biodiversity crisis is so large that really uh, efforts have to be targeted uh, and be very specific to try to benefit those most in need. And the EDGE of Existence program uh, has some criteria to help establish that. And based primarily on two things, do the species have few or no close relatives, meaning a, a very small clade, and is the species in danger of extinction because all of the remaining populations are threatened? Uh, and so these two categories can help to identify species that should be targeted for more intense conservation efforts. And as I mentioned, uh, a lot of this is very uh, maybe depressing or, or doom and gloom that um, species are going extinct, but every individual person can have a positive impact by your daily actions and things that you do to help uh, preserve our local ecosystems and natural habitats and promote biodiversity on a daily basis.